Okay, so um, I'm just going to go through some of the different ways that acupuncture um, can be used. So we'll start off with the, what were the four we just mentioned? Stress reduction, and yeah. tendency. Let's go with stress reduction. So uh, one of the ways you see acupuncture commonly used, I think in the Western context a lot, and in the sort of modern um, lifestyle context is stress reduction, for which acupuncture is remarkable. Um, the, the, the something about when you put an acupuncture needle in somebody that it tends to create um, um, it, it creates shifts in the nervous system. One of the features of, of course of you know modern life is that um, people are, are at, a, at a low level of fight or flight. They're at a low level of adrenal activation like a lot like could be like for their entire working day and then getting home and doing the dishes and picking up the kids and all that stuff people are in this low level state of um fight or flight uh whereas if you look at hunter gatherer tribes they're in a high level state of fight or flight for relatively shorter periods like maybe whilst they're hunting for game or um, doing something like that and then they have much longer periods where it's very relaxing it's very you know rhythmical rhythmical lifestyle and and and, and karma so one of the features of modern life is yeah that that, that level of um, adrenal hyperactivation um, is is torturous for people it's just uh, it, it, it's just not good and so when you you they come in and they get an acupuncture treatment one of the things that, that often is surprising to people for people who are new to this is how kind of relaxed the whole experience becomes for them uh, how deeply relaxing um, that's not something that was particularly stressed in the ancient times about acupuncture because it probably wasn't um, in any way needed as much and maybe not have been noticed as much because um, they were using really big, heavy needles <laughs> and bleeding and lancing and so on. So they know they had a relaxation component. And the idea that you, you lie down with the needles in and you rest um, is a little bit more common in modern acupuncture than it was in ancient acupuncture, where most often the needles were put in for a short period of time, taken out. Um, but I do think it's a tremendous advantage, trem tremendously useful. And you, you can run an acupuncture practice just for that. Just for, just for that stress reduction effect. Um, expensive naps, as one person is joking, you put it. Expensive acupuncture nap, but actually very useful. Um, what was next on that little initial list? Um, I wrote down uh, addictive tendency next. Yeah, we got to talk about addiction. So, um, Again, this is probably more of a modern um, usage of acupuncture than an ancient one, although there are references to alcoholism and the treatment of alcoholism in the Neijing. Um, but, but, but fundamentally, this is a you know, much more modern usage. Um, it just again, very useful because it's a pattern interrupt and addictive patterns tend to be ways that we cope. And oftentimes in our society, they're ways that we cope with um, the continuous <clears throat> the continuous level of fight or flight stress that is is present or ways that we cope with trauma um so um yeah acupuncture can be a very useful pattern interrupt for addictive tendencies and definitely can be very effective especially as part of an overall approach where um you're not necessarily making the assumption that just the acupuncture magically and, and a serious addiction is going to go away but well the intervention of acupuncture applied regularly along with um, the other kind of support mechanisms um, of you know therapy or uh, you know group approaches or, or in-depth discussion and exploration of the subject with the patient can make a really big difference um, what's the next thing on that list um, oh. problems and pain management what did you say? Pain management. Before that? Joint problems. Oh, generally, yeah. Actually, let me just go back to um, the addiction um, story. So, you know, one of the most uh, interesting sort of modern acupuncture variants is using ear acupuncture for addictions. And um, ear acupuncture has been shown to be, I think, the most effective intervention in um, 
I think it was in certain populations who were dealing with heroin addiction, crystal meth, and so on, where um, the air acupuncture protocols um, worked out um, by the NADA folks are, are very effective. And, and also you can treat a lot of people fairly quickly that way. So, you know, that's a whole other um, possibility. So now, um, pain. Let's talk about pain. So, um, you know, acupuncture is famous for treating pain. Acupuncture is often very effective for treating pain. Um, you can run a pain management practice uh, as an acupuncturist. Um, honestly, the treatment of pain with acupuncture um, is just a trick. <laughs> it's kind of a trick. It's kind of a, like fooling the brain, but there's a value to that. I don't want to. I don't want to suggest that that isn't useful because. Um, when people get when people are in long-term pain and when they're in chronic pain there's a whole way that the pain syndrome is kind of locked in to the nervous system locked in to the you know the stress response locked into the endocrine system locked into the personality locked into the beliefs the person might have um, and acupuncture can work uh, very effectively just on a biomechanical level to um, shift the brain's perception of pain and and most of the time in a, in a chronic pain situation that alone can be a very very useful intervention um, there are numerous um, you know ways of working with acupuncture for uh, to interrupt the pain cycle and to treat pain um, and I can't really speak to to what is the most effective I can because um, the study of acupuncture from an objective point of view, you know, double blind and all that kind of thing, is uh, frankly somewhat nonsensical. Um, I don't think it's the, it, in any way the, the best way to actually determine whether acupuncture works or not, or what it's effective for. I think it's, I, I, mean, I truly believe that most of the way that Western medicine studies things like acupuncture is completely nonsensical. Um, but you can determine um, how acupuncture works by looking at the uh, just the historical record and the experiences of you know billions of patients and millions of acupuncturists over the last two thousand years. Um, in the realm of management of pain, um, there's a, there's different approaches. Like the TCM acupuncture approach is often that you're going to use quite a lot of local needles. Um, which I and many other practitioners have not found to be the most effective of all the different pain management systems that are out there. Another way you can work with pain is, is the trigger point approach, where from the site of pain you might be looking to see where there are specific um, reactive points. And in this regard, what the Chinese figured out about the acupuncture channel system is not that different than what Janet Travell figured out with the whole um, development of trigger point therapy um, in, in America. She, I think she was an osteopath. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, there's a site of pain and then we're going to be looking to see if there's other reactive points that might be connected to that site of pain um, through a channel association or through an um, agonist antagonist muscle association and so on. And, and that, in my opinion, trigger point acupuncture is helpful and more effective than local acupuncture. Um, another way to work with pain is using the uh, mirroring approaches where let's say if somebody has pain in the wrist I might be working on the ankle if they have pain in the right wrist I might prefer and preferentially treat the left ankle and there are numerous of these um, mirroring relationships because the acupuncture channel system has this you know wide um, sort of network um, of interrelationships between the channels and so we can use those interrelationships to do what we call distal treatments. Distal treatments means the needles are they're not right where the pain site is, they're not even necessarily where the um, affected trigger points are, they're quite far away. I might be treating the feet for the head and the hand for the foot and the elbow for the knee and the front for the, uh, to treat the back and so on and this is like sort of the a little bit the magic of acupuncture because um, you know, you're putting a need, needle uh, in somebody's foot and, and their headache goes away. So that's where it's like, oh, it's a kind of amazing thing. And definitely that form of distal acupuncture is, I would say, again, more effective than local acupuncture um, when you get it right. 
Um, there's another um, way of working with acupuncture, which is using um, um, holographic zones. Um, so the idea of a holographic zone in acupuncture is that um, the whole body could be reflected in the ear. Like we, um, we can map the whole body onto the ear, and so if we know somebody's got a liver problem, they've got pain in the middle of their torso on the right side, coming from the liver or gallbladder, we can map exactly where that is on the ear. Now, there are other areas where we have these holographic maps. Um, <coughs> for example, the feet, the hands, um, the belly around the navel, uh, the, the points along uh, either side of the spine. There are many, many of these discrete maps in the body which are um, holograms for the whole. And uh, that's a very integral part of Chinese medical uh, thinking. And uh, again, very useful. And many acupuncturists have their entire career just based on, they're just doing ear acupuncture or something like that. You know, just very focused on one particular um, holog holographic map. Um, what, what else was on that list? Oh, no, I think we covered that list. Anyway, let me mm -hmm. jump to mine. So, um, yeah, let's just, let me just go back to musculoskeletal and to joints, um, because uh, one of the things that I encounter quite often when patients come to my clinic is that um, people actually have no idea of how um, acupuncture could do more than just relieve pain. Now, functionally speaking, if you're relieving pain, um, you're presumably initiating some kind of change under, some kind of change underneath. So we can think about uh, medicine as lesional and functional. Uh, like in other words, let's say somebody has uh, pain in this joint, it's a very common joint to have pain in. Have there actually been changes in the joint where you see, um, you know, the, the bones have actually got bone spurs and they've actually got degeneration and so you've got a, maybe, and maybe inflammation around the, the, you know, the linings of the um, uh, tendons and ligaments and so on and we could you know do x-rays and MRIs and so on and so yeah there's lesional changes physical changes that actually happened on the other hand somebody might have joint pain and you can take an x-ray and MRI and they don't really see anything but the person still has joint pain and we could call that functional pain it's some, somewhere in the functioning of the body there's a lot of pain we can't actually see what's causing it with our current ability to um, you know do MRIs and, and scans and so on and people often have the idea that well acupuncture might be able to take the pain away, but that doesn't mean it's actually going to affect the underlying, and, and truly it does affect the underlying. Um, and obviously getting the body to physically change something takes uh, a little bit longer than just getting the pain to go away. So it's a little bit more of a process involved, but absolutely possible. The other aspect of this, which is interesting to think about, is that um, let's say somebody comes for back pain, common issue, in the human body and they one of the interesting things that i'm back pain is just an example of this but it's very interesting is that when they take uh, a set number of people who have back pain um in a study and um, the study has been done multiple times and they say let's say they mri everybody's back in the study um and 50 percent of the study participants have back pain and 50 percent of the study participants don't they actually can't, when looking at those MRIs, figure out who has pain and who doesn't, which is really interesting. Because that means that you could, you could see lesional damage to a joint, uh, but the person has no restriction of function. They're like, oh, I don't really have much pain, I'm fine. I can you know, climb up and down stairs and walk and do all the things I wanna do. Uh, according to my MRI and my X-ray, there's, there's a lot of problems there, but I'm doing great. Or the other way around. You can see people with chronic, chronic pain, and you, you start digging around looking with your um, x-rays and MRIs and blood tests, and you, you can't really see a problem. Um, and yet the person has a lot of pain. So um, sometimes there's a very blurred line between what's a lesional pain, what's a pain derived from an obviously you know, clear dysfunction, and what isn't. But either way, uh, acupuncture can actually shift either of those occurrences. Um, yeah. There's a beautiful saying in the Neijing. This is uh, the second half of the Neijing. This is the Ling Shu. The Neijing is like the Bible of acupuncture. It was written, um, compiled really over a couple thousand years ago. 
Um, it's a very long book because it's just volume two. And um, there's, a, there's a passage somewhere in the Neijing where it says um, all diseases, actually it says of the hundred diseases, but the hundred diseases says a sort of um, stand in for all diseases, um, can be treated from the acupuncture channels. And all diseases show up on the acupuncture channels. So um, I just want to disabuse people uh, of the notion that. Um, which I hear very often as people come in. Well, you know, I want you to treat my migraines. Oh yeah, I've had this pain in my, in, in my hip for like 10 years, but you can't do anything about that because, and then they repeat whatever they've been told, um, you know, because there's a bone spur or because there's a, some other problem. No, we often can, and not always, <laughs> you know. Um, let's talk about internal organ problems. Question? Yes. Um can you talk a little bit about arthritis and how it could systemically be reversible? No. Because okay. <laughs> I want to go through this okay. list. We, let's do a whole other talk on that. Okay. Right? But I want to kind of just talk, because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wanting to work down, you know, the, you know, what could acupuncture be useful, except just to be brief to say, um, in, in my experience, arthritis is commonly reversible, very commonly reversible. Um, with acupuncture, with Chinese herbal medicine, with Qigong, yeah. And probably not always, right? Because there is no always, you know, in any medical system, there's a, you know, if you're batting 90%, you're doing really well, right? So not always, but very, very often. Um, and then just again, in brief, just to kind of briefly answer that question, because that could really be a whole lecture, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is arthritis, you know? We don't really know what causes it. Right, so so th that's worth thinking about. Like, is arthritis actually caused by uh, an emotional issue, a belief system, a genetically inherited tendency, um, um, a pathogen like a, a mycoplasma or a fungal form or some sort of viral form? There's a lot of evidence pointing in all those directions, actually. Right, and there's also just plain. Uh, um, lack of symmetry in the body and overuse. Yeah, and having... right, exactly, mm -hmm. right. I mean, it's just like, you know, there's evidence of dinosaurs having arthritis, of course, you know, it's just like, hey, we're in gravity. <laughs> We've got these complex joints with synovial fluid and, and interactions of planes of, you know, planes of force. And so there's wear and tear, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so moving on, I wanna just go through um, the, some of the different um, ways that acupuncture can be used. Um, Let's talk about internal organ diseases because this, I think, is a whole area that, for me, is really fun to treat. That I think it's not in people's minds. It's like, um, oh, that's something I could go to an acupuncturist for. Um, and I, it's it's also I think quite possible that there are many acupuncturists out there who themselves don't grasp how fully effectively they could treat internal organ um, issues with acupuncture. So, um, I don't know what to say about that. Um, just just from just from the clinical practice here in the last few months, we we had a for example a serious case of um, uh, liver failure, and it's actually one of the fun things about acupuncture is that it's actually really uh, you'll see a lot of the really dramatic benefits of acupuncture when the situation is serious, when the person's in a critical situation um that's where the acupuncture can kind of come in um and sort of act a little bit like a fulcrum so that you can get the person to shift and that's where you'll often see these rather dramatic turnarounds with acupuncture um the entire acupuncture system is, is based on an, on an interweaving of these energy channels that run through the limbs and uh, through the torso and through the whole body with the internal organs. And the Chinese spent a lot of time understanding internal organ interrelationships. So when we talk about an internal organ, when we talk about an organ in Chinese medicine, like the kidney or the spleen or the liver, we whenever we use those words, we're not using the word in the way that Western medicine would um, use them as like this discrete organ here. We're using them as organ systems. We're not saying that because it's a, it's a, it's a mouthful to keep talking about the, 
the lung system, the liver system, the kidney system, and so on. But that's what we're dealing with. And one of the great strengths of the Chinese medical model is the very carefully worked out interrelationships between uh, different energy channels on the body and then the, you know, the, the arms and the legs and um, internal organs and on the interrelationships between um, different organ components and different body parts and different um, mental and emotional qualities or personality qualities and different emotional states and different times of day and different times of year and different preferences in terms of what kind of foods you like to eat, the tastes and the flavors, and how all of these can be related. Like it's, it's, uh, so when we talk about the kidney, for example, then that's the kidney system. So that's the physical kidneys, but also the bladder. Um, it's also very deeply connected into the reproductive system and the ovaries and the testes. Um, and then also obviously connected to the prostate, connected to uh, the uterus, uh, but connected also to the spinal cord, connected to the spine, connected to the brain, and then related to the knees, related to the ankles, related to the lower back, uh, related to hearing and the ears, uh, related to uh, the winter time, related to uh, different times of day. So. This gives us this ability in Chinese medicine and with acupuncture to actually treat internal organ problems uh, using information that is not really available in the Western medicine model, which once you start practicing acupuncture and you start seeing, you know, um, patients day in and day out, you will be mind blown at how frequently you see these overlaps. I'll give you an example from yesterday. This was like brilliant, blew my mind, it was so cool. Patient came in, and she just had been through a whole slew of blood tests, and not just regular Western medical blood tests, but the actually more sophisticated blood testing that quite a lot of holistic MDs do. And everything checked out great, except her cholesterol level. Her cholesterol level was high, and it was high in quite a few of the different parameters. And um, so, you know, basically, you know, what that cholesterol level was telling me was, you know, there's, a, there's an issue with fat metabolism, maybe there's an issue with the blood with the, the, the blood circulation and the circulation system, right? Um, but I just, I didn't know that was true for sure, because many times somebody will have just a, you know, a mildly or even moderately elevated cholesterol level, there's nothing wrong with them. And that's a whole complicated story for another video. Um, so I started um, taking the pulses uh, and, and doing acupressure to, to measure the reaction at different points and so on. And, and when I was uh, working on her spine, I found a very major area of imbalance right around um, T7 and um, just to the side of T7. And it took me a few minutes to put the pieces together. I was like, oh, well, do you have a lipoma here? Which means a benign fatty you know, thing that some people get under their skin. And she's like, no, I don't have any lipomas, and no one's ever told me I have a lipoma there. But it felt like a lipoma because it felt like a fatty accumulation. And I'm, like, mm, I'm interested by that because she also has no history of lipomas. And then I, then the penny dropped. Um, this, this lipoma, this accumulation of fatty tissue, was over an acupuncture point, um, which we know in Chinese medicine as the influential point of blood. And and so I'm like, huh, okay. She only has one problem that, we, that anyone's been able to assess from very, very in-depth testing, actually. Um, and that problem is there's too much fat accumulating in her blood circulation system, in her blood system. And there is one point out of all the different, you know, 365 acupuncture points in the human body. That's just sort of a traditional idea. Of course, there are many more, actually. And that zone, the influential point of blood, which therefore also means, because any, any time we name an organ or a tissue as a system, it's an influential point for the blood vessels, has an accumulation of fat on it, rather dramatic accumulation of fat. So you see, we've got a really detailed map 
in Chinese medicine. And that detailed map enables us to see correlates and relationships that enables us to treat internal organ issues just, just you know, distally so that we can treat the brain from the foot or we can treat, you know, the liver from an acupuncture point on your arm or on your leg and so on. This is a great strength of Chinese medicine. Um, okay, let's uh, keep uh, going down this list. Um, so another way that acupuncture is used, and, you, and uh, this is a, a, a way of working with acupuncture which has been um, uh, brought, you know, br brought forth uh, as a kind of alternative tradition to the, the traditional ch Chinese TCM acupuncture approach that is most common um, here in California, and that is a five element tradition. So the idea of a five element tradition is that um, it's based on typology, that there are different types of people. And then uh, Chinese medicine you know, comes out of uh, Taoist philosophy. And so there's an understanding that uh, we're working with a five element system. And so you can classify people as a metal type, a water type, a fire type, a wood type, an earth type. And that you know, when, once you're studying Chinese medicine, you start seeing all these correlations and um, connections between different things. It, it starts to become very apparent that this typology is quite real, right? So, for example, we classify the lung and the large intestine and the skin as metal organs. And so, when you see somebody who's obviously a metal body typology, before you ask them or know anything about their health, you just look at their hands, you look at their face, and there's a there's a sort of typology that we've um, learned over the last couple of thousand years of Chinese medicine that we can look at something and say, oh, this is a metal type person, very strong metal. Then you know automatically they're more likely to have skin issues. They're more likely to have sinus allergies. They're more likely to have asthma or some lung problems. Uh, they're more likely to have constipation or diarrhea or some large intestine problem because their constitutionality predisposes them to certain specific organ system challenges or strengths or both. Because if you have a constitutionality, let's say your constitutionality is, is your very strong fire, uh, then we're gonna be thinking about your small intestine, we're gonna be thinking about your heart, we're gonna be thinking about some other things in your body. And those could be great strengths and they could also be weaknesses or they could be both simultaneously. So we can work with that constitutionality using the acupuncture channel system and there are other constitutional systems in korean acupuncture they work with a um i think there's a number of different korean systems but they work with a four constitution system a three constitution system um you can work with the six phases as constitutions that's a whole other thing you can actually work with the archetypes of um the, um, the acupuncture channels uh co correlating to the 12 animals of the Chinese zodiac and there's a lot of different ways you can work this but um, it's this idea that actually you could affect change at a really deep level because when we're talking about constitutionality we're talking about mental and emotional proclivities mental and emotional patterns um, very very deep aspects of, of a human being that can be adjusted often just with a few needles, once the practitioner has perceived what the constitutional level of the process is and has that intention to adjust the constitutional um, level, level of imbalance. So that's a whole other way we can work with acupuncture. And that sort of leads me into just the idea of acupuncture for mental and emotional processes. Um, you know, our Western thinking comes um, with a lot of ba baggage uh, and the sort of Cartesian model of the separation of body and mind, of the separation of um, the, the physical and, uh, and spirit, right? There's a very, very deep um, dualistic models in the, the Western um, religious thinking and um, philosophical thinking, and now also in our, in our scientific thinking, that there's a great tendency to um, view things as somatic or psychic and the, the, the <laughs> one of the common games in western medicine is if you have somebody who has a disease and you can't figure out what's causing it 
you tell them that it's psychic, you tell them it's all in their head, right? So, uh, and then we've got this idea of, um, you know, psychosomatic, that, that because somebody is upset, it's creating a, a, a physical, you know, condition in their body. Chinese medicine actually plays a little bit more with somatopsychic, uh, which is the idea that your constitutionality, the deep uh, function or dysfunction of uh, different organ systems and energy channels and energy centers in your body, um, could actually be playing, uh, having a large effect on how you're doing mentally and emotionally and what that is. Um, suffice it to say that adjusting and working with the mental and emotional process uh, is really quite easy to do in the context of an acupuncture treatment. Um, but here I think it's very important that we expand the definition of what an acupuncture experience is because you couldn't, or I, I suggest that you probably shouldn't, <laughs> train a robot to, to put needles in at a, you know, designated acupuncture points um, with the intention of that um, helping with somebody's you know, mental or emotional problems or anguish or so on. Um, I think I'm saying this wrong because actually that might work. Let, let me put it this way. When an acupuncturist gives an acupuncture treatment, um, it's not just about the needles. That's a very sort of narrow, materialistic um, definition of what's actually happening. Um, what's actually happening when an acupuncturist um, works with a patient is the acupuncturist is dialing in their awareness, their sensitivity, to all the different cues. Like we're oftentimes, because of our tradition, we're taking the pulses, that's giving us um, probably about 80, 90, 100 different, um, potentially, <laughs> 80, 90, 100 different um, information points. But most usefully, it's dialing us into where the main problems are and what those problems are. And then we might um, uh, look at the tongue, that can give us a lot more information. Are we going to ask the person what's going on and see how what they say correlates or doesn't correlate with what we're finding from our more um, um, you know, tactile and objective kind of measures. And then there is doing acupressure and, and figuring out which, which uh, zones and which points are reactive and what those zones and those points are, are reflexes for, what they're telling us about the underlying system. So as an acupuncturist, you're gathering all this information, you're talking to the person, you're listening to them, in the, in the old classics, they would say, um, oh, what's I get those, these four Chinese words they always put together. Um, I forget. But basically, it's, 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 it's listening, seeing, feeling, hearing, smelling. Like you're, you're absorbing with your senses the information about the patient. Now, in my practice, I'm really interested in the physical body, what's going on with it. Um, from what I can figure out and what the patient's going to tell me and what their experience is. I'm also e equally interested in what I would call the mental and emotional body or bodies. Um, I want to know how the person's doing, how they feel about their own life, what that process is. And then I'm also interested in the, the story of their life, the narrative, the, um, the story, right? Because we've all got a story. <laughs> And that, that story has heroes and villains and, and good days and bad days and, you know, beautiful things happening and, and very challenging things happening. And once I'm, I'm hearing the story of the person and I'm seeing and experiencing how it's all correlated all the way down to the fact that their little toe hurts or um, they always wake up every night at 2.30 and that is significant in terms of the, um, the correspondences of the hours to the organs and so on. Then with my acupuncture, I'm using my presence and my inquiry as part of the treatment. I can, I, I, I can affect you know, very beneficial changes for people with their mental and emotional process. But at that point, it's not just the mechanicality of the needle, although that might and I actually does have some definite benefit. It's that the, the acupuncture practitioner themselves is the medicine. Or, or if you like, they are, the, they, they are the intervention. The intervention is not just the needle. The intervention is the needle and it's the person doing the needling and, and all of that context of how the whole space, the wholeness of the, the way the person is showing up is held. So on that note of the mental and emotional um, treatments using uh, acupuncture, let's talk about trauma. Trauma is a good one. Um, 
and acupuncture can be very, very helpful for trauma. Um, but again, let's bear in mind that when I say acupuncture, it's not just placing some needles, although that definitely is a big part of it. It's also um, the bodywork part, the, the touching, the pressing, the finding things in the map of the um, fascial system. Like what, because what, what does that tell us? The whole thing's a map. Um, the whole thing's a guidebook to what's really going on. When we start doing that uh, in the treatment of somebody with acupuncture, um, very often we start to peel off layers or unlock layers. Now, when I say trauma, I'm referring really to a very specific process. It's a process by which um, there's a degree of shock that occurs. So that trauma could be because a tree falls on your house and there's a whole le level of shock that happens if you're in the house and, and somehow you survive. Um, and or it could be, you know, uh, getting beaten as a child, sexual abuse, all that bad stuff. Um, when we undergo trauma, there, there is a, a normal process of putting aside the, uh, the elements of the experience, putting aside uh, the emotional elements of the experience, mental elements of the experience, in order to maintain that um, uh, functioning process that, that, that keeps us surviving and that keeps us in the social context of our family or our society or, and how we picture ourselves. In other words, it's, it's, it's a self-protective mechanism that, that fires off. And so then the actual energies of the physical shock of the trauma and the emotions of the trauma and the the mental um you might say disequilibrium or the mental um um damage of the of, of of the trauma all of that gets kind of pushed down and held in the body mind system now in order to understand how that is held and where that is held um you have to get a little you know deeper into some of the understandings of uh, somatic based psychology um, which has really gotten quite deeply into this um, well I, th I think that sort of a lot of uh, current modern psychology hasn't quite landed there yet um, when we undergo a, a, a treatment process with uh, acupuncture and this is this is somewhat dependent upon the ability and the awareness of the practitioner to enable this to unfold but when we um when we start that process it's like peeling off a layer or taking the lid off of something that's being held down it's being it's being held in a in a sort of static state um where is it held i, I would say that it's sort of held in the electromagnetic fields of the energy fields of the body it's also held in the fascia and maybe some of the energy fields within the body of the fascia and of the organs and so on it's difficult to say where it's held because from the my point of view my model of what is a human is the physical body but then it's also the energy bodies and uh, the mental and emotional body and the spiritual body and so where is trauma held kind of in all three or four right and um, that's not something i think that the western thinking has quite grasped but we can um, do great work with trauma, right? The, the, the working with the mental and the emotional and the spiritual and the sort of trauma healing uh, sides of uh, acupuncture and Chinese medicine is much more dependent on the practitioner having the capacity to, to sort of hold the space for that uh, and to hold that process with um, awareness and compassion and calm and so that's not something that every acupuncturist um, has the training to do or has the understanding to do or has the inclination to do. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. I think if a, if a practitioner is um, very sensate in their, in their orientation um, rather than being more mental or emotional or intuitive in their orientation and they love to do pain relief and they love to do, you know, get in there and work the joint in a very physical way, 
Chinese medicine and acupuncture, it has all of that there already. The, the big part of the purpose of this talk is to show you that it has all of that already, and then it has about three or four other layers more, right? Where according to the capacity of the practitioner, you can use the whole system to work the emotional and mental piece. You can use the whole system to work trauma. You can use that whole system to work the spiritual, um, maybe evolutionary impulse of the person to to evolve and to and to grow and to expand and to um, raise consciousness. Um, so yeah, there's that too. Um, I'm gonna just bounce out a few other things. How, can you give me a time check, Kelly? Um, it's two twenty. We have oh. time for ten minutes. Okay, oh, good. good. Um, I'm just gonna bounce to a few other things here. Um, detoxification. Um, so. Um, when you when you start an acupuncture uh, treatment process, um, w one of the possibilities is, is that the person will go into uh, detoxification. And so, um, what do I mean by that? Because de detoxification is a really um, a buzzword of um, alternative med the alternative medicine community. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's <laughs> it's a valid buzzword, um, and and in, in order to understand um, what that is, um, let me just define it a little bit. So, um, we perhaps think we know more about medicine than we actually do in our current culture. Um, for example, cancer. Uh, we know that cancer is practically the leading cause of death. It's vying in America with um, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, um, as the, the number one killer. Um, but we also know, and this is not talked about very much at all, that 200 years ago, hardly anybody got cancer. And that is actually demonstrably, <laughs> that's a known fact. Um, from medical records that were being kept 115, 200 years ago in European hospitals, detailed medical records. We know that many of our current diseases, they're new. Parkinson's disease, which you know, apparently now we're all getting at Parkinson's, everybody has some degree of Parkinson's by the time they're 18 or 90 years old, apparently. That's a new disease. Parkinson's disease was like first recorded 150 years ago or something. And we have a little bit this erroneous idea that if uh, that, that everybody prior to like sort of the 19th century was a barbarian and didn't know anything about what was going on. No, they were good observers of life and good observers of, of disease. There was very little cancer. We know the first heart attacks were only recorded 100 and some, I don't know, 40 or 50 years ago, I think it was in, in hospitals in Paris. People didn't drop with heart attacks. It's like if you study hunter-gatherer tribes, as they, people did when there were still hunter-gatherer tribes, back in the 50s and 60s, no cardiovascular disease, like none, right? Um, people didn't get heart disease, they didn't get cancer, they didn't get a lot of these weird neurological things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. We are in an, a, an age of radically new diseases, um, <clears throat> which are the ones that are basically killing everybody. And we are also in an age where there are 5,000 generally recognized as safe, which actually just means grandfathered in and untested most of the time, chemicals, uh, when we're bathed in an ocean of electromagnetic frequencies, which haven't been really particularly carefully studied because there's more political motivation for bringing out a new iPhone and, or cell phone than, you know, <laughs> testing to really see how, how safe it is. So we're bathed in all this new electromagnetic stuff we have thousands of chemicals that we're now exposed to. We have higher levels of background radiation because of nuclear bomb testing. Um, and you know, a lot of that you could just put under the rubric of toxins, like microplastics, nano, nanoplastic particles. Oh, it turns out you've got like half a pound in your body or something, or dioxins, these incredibly potent chemicals. A baby gets its lifetime you know, exposure to dioxins in the first six months of breastfeeding. Um, so, I put all that under the rubric of toxins, and here's the thing about toxins and toxicity. Um, when toxins come into the body, the body's intel innate intelligence and functionality has a means of either discharging to get rid of the toxins, or 
putting them into latency, putting them into storage, storing them in the fat tissue, for example. And this can actually be demonstrated. You can do fairly careful studies to look at that. The study of toxicity is not that interesting to the main, main Western medical kind of uh, thinking of things because um, th there'd be some finger pointing <laughs> if we started to really look at the role of toxicity in the generation of all these new diseases, which we don't even, in our dialogue about disease, we don't even talk about that they're new diseases, but the heart, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurological diseases, they're all new, right? And what do we know that's new? Well, chronic stress, tons of toxins. So when we start working with acupuncture uh, and Chinese medicine, there's a way that the body can actually release held toxins, stored toxins. And um, that's a profound and useful effect of Chinese medicine. I just want to kind of draw people's attention to a little bit. Um, last thing I've got on my little list here, and then I've got to stop talking, is infection. Um, and, and I would just say, like, really serious situations, like emergency room situations. One of the things that I wish was happening was that we, we could see more acupuncture in emergency rooms, because in, 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 in emergency situations, Acupuncture uh, can have profoundly rebalancing effects, but in order to understand that, um, it's, it's, there's a need a little bit to talk about um, energy movement in the body. So just to give an example, let's say somebody has a really, really bad migraine, and they have a history of migraines. They get a migraine once or twice a week. That's, a, that, that's an energetic pattern where it looks like some kind of uh, internal heat uh, internal inflammatory processes coming up in the body and going to the head. When we see that pattern, we'll also often see corresponding other patterns that match that, such as, for example, oh, the person also has acid reflux, heartburn. That's an energy thing going up. They get dizzy regularly. That can be seen as an energy thing going up. Like, they, get, they get weird ear stuff. They get red burning eyes. Uh, or, or it could be the opposite tropism. You might see, oh, my feet are really hurting. I've got you know, plantar fasciitis, but it also has a varicose veins happening. I've also got this pain in the hips because there's an energy tropism of blockage downwards. And so in acupuncture and Chinese medicine, we're looking at energy directionality. Uh, in emergency situations where somebody is really in crisis, the ability of an acupuncture treatment to rebalance that energetic tropism and shift the person out of crisis is quite dramatic. We in the West rarely see that because we're not employing acupuncturists in emergency room contexts. Um, but I wish we did, and that's actually a very powerful way that acupuncture, acupuncture can be used. And I imagine in the future we could have teams of acupuncturists working in an emergency room setting, so it'll really make a difference for people. Um, and then also infections. <clears throat> Um, you know, our standard with infections, of course, is, you know, antibiotics or, if we're, you know, thinking about, you know, um, COVID, the recent sort of COVID story and the, that kind of epidemic infectious disease process. Acupuncture is great. Uh, I've had so many cases of infection that, well, <clears throat> maybe the person's been on antibiotics for 10 days or two weeks or they're on their second or their third round of antibiotics and they've got an ear infection, an eye infection, or cellulitis, or some, some infection somewhere. It's stuck. It's not moving. The, the case is not progressing. <clears throat> the doctors look at it and we're like, well, let's try, let's try a stronger antibiotic. You know, let's try something else. Um, you, you bring in the acupuncture, you shift the energy field, you shift the tropism of the way the energy is blocked or the way the energy is moving, and boom, the infection starts to, to clear up really fast, just from the acupuncture treatment. So anyways, I gotta go treat patients. Um, this has been a talk to try and sort of give uh, a little bit of a broader perspective on the different ways that uh, we can work with acupuncture to affect change and um, to broaden the understanding and the, and the conversation about acupuncture out of just, you know, pain relief to many, many other ways that it can help. All right, thanks a lot. Bye-bye.